Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our February 3rd edition of Launchable Live with Al. Uh, my name is Ian O'Brien, and I'm the VP of Marketing for Launchable. <laughs> I'm joining you from cold and rainy New England, just near the New York border. Uh, feel free to chime in where you're from during our presentation today if you feel like it. Uh, you're here for a view of our product here at Launchable. So Al, a co-founder and senior director of product, will show you how engineering teams are using Launchable to shorten feedback cycles and ship high quality code fast so you can get ahead of the dev cycle. So I'm now turning it over to my colleague, Al. Hey everybody, uh, it's good to be here. I'm joining from very, very cold, but also very, very sunny, Ian, um, Boulder, Colorado. And um, yeah, today we're gonna talk about how we can use automation to deliver high quality web and mobile apps fast. So today we're gonna go through a little bit about the company and then jump, jump between some slides that go over how the product works and also um, some live demos with uh, our web app and CI tools as well. So a little bit about us, um, our, our mission is based on the fact that we believe that software teams will drive every significant human achievement. And so our mission is to transform these artisan teams into data-driven scientists delivering software confidently. We think there's a, you know, the software development process generates a lot of data, right? And so we can use that data to improve the process. And a little bit about our co-CEOs, um, Harpreet and Kosuke. Um, they work together at CloudBees. Um, Kosuke is the creator of Jenkins CI. And so they've spent a lot of time working on um, uh, digital or DevOps transformations with enterprises and really have gotten to know a lot about how um, software teams, especially in enterprises, um, work and the challenges they face. So. When it came time to start the company, um, it became clear that testing is a real uh, remains a, a really big bottleneck, um, increasing cycle times in the DevOps infinity loop. Um, there's lots of uh, tooling and, th and thinking and process around a lot of the other stages of the of the um, of the DevOps cycle that have been optimized, and but now you know when we talk to teams tests still remain like, how can we test more efficiently? So that's where Launchable comes in. And we break our product down into kind of three product lines, right? All of the product, all everything we do is based on data. So that, that means your build data and your testing data. And so that means, you know, you, you can start sending your data to Launchable and start seeing simply that, right? A database of your test runs, which is a really, valuable asset to have and a lot of teams that a lot of teams don't have that launchable can provide mm -hmm. so immediately after signing up for launchable or starting to work with us you can start sending us your test data and your build data and start seeing your test runs and test results in web ui which is great for developers you know it's a little bit better that to view your test results in launchable um, than maybe scrolling through um, ci logs and so on and then once that data has been um, once you've been sending that those test results for a little while, we can start to use that data to provide um, insights. So kind of passive insights where um, we can reveal trends. Again, because we have this database of your test runs, right? We can reveal trends and we can also reveal flaky tests and you can use this these dashboards to improve the health of your test suites and maybe uncover some information that you didn't have before that can help you make decisions about how to run your tests or how to change your test suites. And then we also, you know, th those are kind of passive insights where you take the data from us and then you, you decide, okay, how should I go and change things? We also have the concept of um, like a product line around actions. So predictive test selection is where we actually plug Launchable into your CI process and you can use Launchable to automatically change the way that your tests run uh, to be more efficient and save lots of developers time. So let's talk a little bit about the kinds of teams that typically work with us. Um, a lot of them have relatively mature applications. These can be web apps, 
mobile apps, packaged and shipped apps doesn't really make a difference. The thing in common is that is that these teams have a lot of tests, right? Um, in some cases, we're working with enterprises that have a centralized uh, build and test pipeline. And by that, I mean, they might have like a, a large piece of software, uh, maybe that's been around for a few years that has been broken into lots of different components. And you can imagine maybe one team works with one component, um, another team works with another component and they, those components are all assembled into a single piece of software that's then tested. So you have lots of teams kind of going into the central build pipeline. And in that scenario, you tend to have lots of tests because you have lots of these components, right? So that's one, uh, one kind of pattern that we've seen. Um, another area is teams that are running lots of tests and pull requests. Maybe when an application is, is a bit younger, um, your tests, your pull request tests, you want to run as many tests as early as possible in the pipeline to give developers as fast feedback as possible. But over time, those tests, those test suites grow and it becomes diff more difficult to run all the tests earlier. So you start having to make decisions about which tests to run when or which tests to test suites to run at different times. So that's something we can help with. Um, and then there's another uh, group of, of teams we work with where their tests are so long, they've already moved that their tests, their test suite out into maybe a nightly run of regression tests. Um, and maybe they've kept a smaller set of smoke tests that they run more frequently. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But those teams, you know, the, the developers have to wait maybe a day, maybe two days to get test results. And so we can help shift some of those tests left and give developers faster feedback. And another group that we um, that we work with, and sometimes this is in combination with all these other ones, is teams that have have so many tests that they've started to use parallelization. Um, but if, over time, they might be reaching the limits of the usefulness of additional parallelization. And so they um, they work with us to to run tests uh, in, an, in, a, in an optimized fashion. So we can layer launchable on top of parallelization as well. So as I mentioned earlier, um, all of our products and all of our values are kind of based on the data that you send to us. So let's take a look at how you do that. And that's with the, uh, by using the launchable CLI in your CI process. So if I jump over to, I have a GitHub, like a demonstration GitHub repository. And it's like a Java app, very simple, calculated with four functions and four tests, one for each function. Um, and this, this app uses Gradle to run tests, it's a Java app using Gradle, but um, Launchable can work with all kinds of different test runners. Um, if I jump over to our documentation site, we'll see a long list of a bunch of different uh, kind of productized integrations that the CLI has with all these different uh, tools and test runners. And it's important to note that Launchable integrates directly with the build or test tool that you use to run tests. It doesn't integrate with the CI service. In fact, um, we, can, we can work with any CI tool, you know, Jenkins, GitHub Actions, Bitbucket Pipelines, Azure DevOps, Circle CI, that kind of thing. It doesn't really make a difference. If you don't use one of these tools that um, is shown here, then let us know. We have other solutions as well. Um, so if we jump back over to, to our GitHub repository, we'll see on line six here, this is, this is a script that we run every time we want to run tests. And it's very simple, Gradle W test, pretty straightforward. And I decided, Hey, I want to start sending data to Launchable because I want to see my test information, these insights, my test results. And I uh, want to start using predictive test selection. So the way that I do that is I go to launchableinc.com. I can sign up on the web, or you can contact us to work with you directly in, a, in an enterprise POC. And we'll, we'll or you'll create a, what's called a workspace, which is like where all of your data uh, lives for that test suite. And you'll also generate an API key, which you'll use to start using the Launchable CLI to record your test results and your builds to Launchable. And the CLI is a Python package you can install in, in your uh, CI script using pip3. And it has a variety of commands you can run. So here on line eight, we're running a simple verification script to make sure that we can connect to the service. And then on lines 11 and 18, we get into the actual interaction between 
your CI run, your pipeline, and the launchable service, which is a cloud service. First thing we do is re-record a build. And when we think about a build in this context, we're thinking about a piece of software that's being tested, right? That has a particular version. Every time you run tests, you're running tests against a particular version of software. And so we want to, we want to capture um, the characteristics of that build so that we can learn from it. So to do that, we say launchable record build, we give it a name. This name is generated automatically from uh, like the, the GitHub actions that we're using, the build name variable. And then we point the CLI at our code repositories. In this case, that's, a, that's the current directory. The CLI goes and runs some Git commands in your Git repository or repositories and extracts some pretty generic metadata. Basically, it's a list of changed files and um, commit hashes. It's not looking at, at actual code. Um, we're looking at Git information. And it says, okay, this, this build has these changed, these uh, commits and, and these changed files. So we can kind of understand what's different about this build. Then we run the tests as normal. It's nothing changing there, nothing changing in how you run tests or anything like that at this point. It's just a kind of a passive um, interaction. And then after you run these tests, gr the Gradle process or whatever tool you're using will generate um, the XML reports of which tests ran and which tests passed and failed and how long they took. And so we point the CLI to those as well. We say launchable record tests. We give it that same build name so that we can associate these tests ran against this build. And then we point uh, the CLI towards the directory of where our test reports are. And so once we've done this across our, um, our test runs, we can now jump into the launchable um, web dashboard and see, this is all demonstration data, as you can see at the top, reviewing a demo, demo workspace. Um, but this, you can see your test runs start to come in. You can see how long they take um, and start to see some information over time. And you can also jump directly into each uh, test run to see, we call them test sessions, to see how long it took, uh, did uh, tests pass or fail. And if there are failures, you can actually kind of triage them here and see the, the console output um, from, from the website to help you fix your tests, which is really cool. And over time, we can start to generate um, those trends and insights from the data that you've started to send. So if I jump over to the insights tab, we've got um, these graphs are like week by week. Um, and when, then we have a section here at the top. And again, this is all kind of demo data, but you could get the idea that you can use these graphs of test session duration, test session frequency, and test failure ratio or test session failure ratio to um, understand how your tests run. So for instance, you might notice, hey, you know, over the last six months, our test session duration has doubled in length and, and that's, that's worth noting, right? Maybe some action needs to be taken there. Or, hey, our test session frequency has gone down or it's gone up. Maybe that's an important thing for your team to understand that you might want to, um, you might want to know about. And finally, the test failure ratio is important or test session failure ratio is important because, um, it gives you a sense of kind of the health of your application and your and your test runs as well. So you get this information pretty quickly, um, and you can start making uh, decisions based on it, based on these insights. And then we also surface the flaky tests in your test suite. So if a test has run uh, multiple times against the same build, we and has different results. Um, each time we can understand that, hey, this test is probably flaky. And that's something you're, you're going to want to look at with your team to understand, hey, do we need to do something here? Do we need to um, improve these tests? That kind of thing. So this is the information you get by just sending test data to Launchable, right? Like I said, we're creating a database of your tests and we can start to surface all this, this cool information. And then over time, that data becomes a really useful asset for training a machine learning model for to use with predictive test selection. So let's talk about what that is and how that works. So predictive test selection, it's kind of in the name. Um, the idea is, can we use, or let's use machine learning to select which tests um, based on a prediction to run for a given build. So if you had the power to select an intelligent subset of tests run at any point in your workflow, how would that change your workflow? We ask this question because a lot of the time 
uh, customers' pipelines you know, when they run which test suites is dictated by how long the entire test suite takes, right? Usually you've got unit tests pretty far left in the, in the life cycle running all the time because they're really quick. They don't take very long. But as test suites grow, for instance, earlier I mentioned like UI tests, system tests, some of these tests that take longer to run, um, a lot of the time those get pushed further right in the process. Uh, simply because that suite takes a long time to run. And so what predictive test selection lets you do is instead of being forced to run all of the tests all of the time and then be stuck running them on a lower frequency, it gives you the ability to run the right test for the change and not run the unimportant test for that change, which gives you great flexibility um, over when to run which suites in your pipeline and to provide much faster feedback to developers and get more green builds. So we use the data that you've been sending us for these other, other products um, to generate a machine learning model that learns from the changed files in every build that you test, which is the top row here, and the test reports that you submitted for each build, uh, for each test run against that build. Over time, the, the logical brain says, oh, okay, you ran these tests against this build and that build had these, had these changes. I'll go ahead and learn something from that. And then over time, we can create, um, a, it creates a predictive model that can be used to, uh, to actually, you can ask the service, hey, I, I'm about to run tests against this build. Which tests should I, should I run? What are the most important tests? And the way that we um, assess uh, the, right, the right target to use for, you know, should I run all the tests, should I run some of the tests, is we, uh, we create what we call these, these different curves. And they show us how effective the, the model is for this particular suite of tests. Each model is kind of unique to its own suite because every suite has its own, uh, its own characteristics, long tests, short tests, different uh, failure ratios, and so on. So this confidence curve, which is one of the key graphs that we can show, um, we show this in the web app, is, a, is something you can use to determine how you can subset your tests using predictive test selection. So it tells us on the y-axis, we have confidence and on the, on the, um, the x-axis, we have the, the total test execution time. So the, the biggest value on this uh, graph is like about 65, maybe 66 minutes. So that tells us that our full test run takes about 66 minutes. And obviously if we run all the tests, we get 100% confidence. Well, what does confidence mean? Well, the confidence is the, the likelihood that if you only run a smaller amount of tests, you're likely to catch a failing run. So in this example, if we go to 90% confidence um, on the y-axis, which means that nine times out of 10, we're gonna catch a failing build by running this amount of tests. We can run only about, what's that? 16, 17 minutes amount of tests. So we can run 16 or 17 minutes instead of 60 plus minutes of tests and catch nine out of 10 failing builds. So that's a huge reduction in the amount of time you're spending running testing with a very small um, difference in, in how much value you're getting out of it. So this means that we can run, for instance, early in the life cycle when developers really want to know, like, did I break it? Did I break the build? Did I break the build? Well, now we can know without having to run all the tests with 90% confidence, whether you broke the build or not, right? Which gives you lots of flexibility here. The way that actually works in your CI system is we, um, we start to interact with the test runner itself. So this is, a, this is a diagram that shows that interaction. You'll notice the, the top row and the bottom row are the same as what we were doing before. So we're sending the, the build information for the Git repo and we're capturing the test results at the end. But now that information from the build is used in combination with the full list of test files you are going to run. Let's say your test suite has a thousand tests in it and a, what we call an optimization target. And we have various kinds of optimization targets, but that's basically the goal that the launchable brain and machine learning model is trying to return the right test to, um, to fulfill. So in this example, we've got a bunch of test files. We use the, um, and this says files, but it could be files, classes, even test cases depends on the on the system. And I'm just using files as, as a generic term here. We pass the list, the full list of tests into the CLI and with a confidence or with a, an optimization target. In this 
case we've chosen, give me enough tests or give me the right tests to give me 90% confidence in the build. And then the launchable brain takes that information and, and very quickly returns a subset of the full list that you sent, uh, which you can uh, plug into your test runner to only run those tests. So let's see what that takes, uh, see what that looks like in our uh, GitHub repo that we were showing earlier. If I jump back over to, um, this is the record only uh, script that we had. And so now I'm gonna jump over to something that looks pretty similar, but adds that subsetting interaction. So if I go back, we'll see, oh, interesting. Okay, we'll go back and we'll see um, the subset. This is called Gradle with launchable subset. And the same as before, we install the CLI, we verify the connection, we create the build or we record the build. And then we add this, this uh, command on line 14 where um, we, we request a subset of tests to run in from launchable. And as I was saying, we say launchable subset, we give it a um, optimization target. In this case, we're using confidence, which, um, which is which is one optimization target. We also have like fixed time or variable time as well. If, if you say, hey, I wanna run 20 minutes of tests. I never want my tests to run longer than 20 minutes. Just give me the best tests to run 20 minutes. We, you can do that as well. In this case, it's gonna return the, the number of, or the amount of tests that are needed to satisfy this condition. So over time, the, the confidence, um, at the beginning of the model training process, the confidence might return quite a lot of tests, maybe all of the, almost all the test suite, but over time as it learns, that will shrink, which is pretty cool. So you see your test runs getting shorter and shorter, but not sacrificing the quality. Anyway, we pass in the build name so we can, so that the service can get the right test for this build, the changes in this build. And then we point to the CLI at our test file so it can go in there and say, okay, what's the full list of tests we would have run? And then the service takes that information and returns a list back in the correct format to be used with the test runner that we're using. So in this case, we're using Gradle and the list of tests will be in the right format so that here on line 20, all we have to do is, um, is echo that list back out into, uh, into Gradle and Gradle will only run those tests. And so this interaction looks a little bit different depending on the test runner that you use, PyTests, NUnit, that kind of thing. But the general idea is the same. You list out all the tests you were gonna run, you send that to Launchable with an optimization target, and then the, which you've decided based on the curve that we showed earlier, and the service returns a subset for you to run. So earlier, I actually used GitHub Actions to run, to run and request um, a subset of tests. I made a intentionally, I intentionally broke something. I broke the division part of our calcul calculator. Um, and so we can see if I jump into my CI log here and scroll back up, we can see the uh, effect of the script that we were just looking at, right? We verified connectivity. We, um, recorded the build, there was a new commit, that's great. And then we got the subset of tests to run for this build. And we created a subset in the workspace and we got back. So as I mentioned earlier, there were only four tests in this, in this demonstration. Um, and it returned one of those, which is 25%. But you can imagine if you have thousands, you know, thousands of tests, um, we could be talking about some pretty serious time savings here. You know? And in this subset, we had the division test. Uh, so we ran the division test and because I intentionally broke it, that failed. So we're able to catch that the build failed, uh, the build was going to fail without having to run all four tests or in the real example, without having to run thousands and thousands of tests. So I found that problem. I was able to update it and fix it. I ran the, the subset on my pull request again, and then I merged that pull request and You'll, you'll notice the difference here is in these names. One is running the launchable subset on pull requests um, because it's earlier in the, in, the, uh, pro, in the process. I would just want to get quick feedback. And then after we merge, or maybe even before you merge, depending on your particular pipeline, we still run the full set of tests, right? So it's always really important, um, both for maintaining quality and for continuing to train the model that we, um, you run all of the tests at some point in your life cycle. Launchable just gives you the flexibility to decide when you want to do that. And usually you can do that less frequently. So 
if I jump back over to my presentation here, there are a couple of different um, use cases that we've seen with, with teams using Launchable. One of them we call shift left, or you could call it kind of intelligence mode testing. Um, so the example here is you've got tests, a very long test suite that's running in the evening, um, at night, and the cycle time is really long, right? A developer might commit something in the morning, and then they're waiting until the next day to find out whether that change broke the build. And there's also additional triage here because a lot of changes are being tested at once. So it's it takes more time to figure out what caused the failure. Well, with Launchable, we can um, start running a subset of the nightly tests. Maybe we'll run that on every pull request. Or in this example, we've got it running during scheduled daily pipeline that runs like every hour or two. So now Launchable can select the most important test to run for that build. Um, and developers can get feedback much more quickly and fix those issues before the nightly test run, which should make the, the nightly test process more green, which is great for everybody. Now, this looks a lot like a smoke testing workflow. Um, a lot of teams will do that. They'll select manually the tests that are kind of most important based on their experience, and they'll run those tests earlier than the nightly tests. With Launchable, you can level up that process by instead of having a fixed list of tests that run, you can run an intelligently selected uh, set of, of tests for each build. So one build might have these tests, another build might have those tests, and uh, while still maintaining that, that degree of confidence. Another use case, which is when your pull request tests get too long to continue running all of them at once, maybe this is UI tests. I think that's something we see pretty often. Um, instead of having to not run those tests at all in the pull request phase, you can run a launchable subset and still get a lot of useful feedback earlier in the life cycle. So in this case, in the before, the top line here, we were running all of the tests. Let's say we're running all the UI tests on every push, but it's taking too long. Um, now we can run a launchable subset and we can, because it takes so much less time that you can push more often and test more often and get that feedback faster. And then either in this example, we have after Git merge, you still run the full set of tests. You're just running it less often, or you could give your developers the choice, right? You could build a system that says, um, whether you, you want to run the, the subset really early and then maybe right before merging, you have to run the full set. We can work with you to find the right strategy. Um, but again, Launchable gives you that flexibility. So just to recap, um, Launchable, you know, we're all about improving the, the testing process in uh, for DevOps teams. And so we um, all you have to do is start sending your, your build and test data to, to then be able to see your test runs and your test results in our web app. Then you can start seeing trends and insights and flaky tests about your test data based on the database of test results that, that we've created for you or you've created using the service. And then on top of that, you can start to dynamically change how you run tests to provide much faster feedback to developers using predictive test selection. So if this is something that um, you know, you're excited about or are interested, interested in, you can sign up directly from um, our website at launchbolink.com and start sending us data using the CLI. Um, if you're in an enterprise as well, and you have lots and lots of teams and you're looking for some guidance about how to get started, um, maybe with a POC, we can definitely work with you on that as well. So um, that's the end of my presentation. I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to listen here and um, be happy to take any questions as they uh, as they come. Thanks. Well, awesome. Thanks so much, Al. Uh, mm -hmm. We do have a couple of questions already. Uh, the first of which is, what does test runs as data exactly mean? Do you instrument the code? Which mm -hmm. data is transmitted now? I understand that that you know I'm I'm a marketing person, so some of this needs to be explained to me. But uh, as as I understand it, Launchable is only sending uh, metadata uh, really over uh, to our engine. Is that is that correct? Is that what's being sent over? That's right. Yeah. So to keep Launchable, and one thing that I actually didn't mention, this gives me an opportunity, is that Launchable works with all different programming languages because um, Launchable uses uh, uses Git metadata, right? And Git doesn't really care what language you're writing, um, writing your, your program in. So on the, on the code side, 
Um, we are we are not instrumenting the code exactly. We're taking the list of changed files from each commit to understand what change in a build. And then on the on the test result side, which is the other half of the important data set, is the test um, is is basically generated from the XML reports that your test runner use it or create. So usually that just includes this pretty standard format that'll include like a test identifier. Maybe that's the, usually the test case uh, name, the class name and the file path of that test. And we join those together to make a unique identifier for a test. And then whether the test passed or failed and um, how long the test took. And if there's like any standard error or standard output that we can use and, and show in the, in the application. So it's, uh, it's fairly, it's, it's data that's kind of generic and, and available across all different kinds of test runners and all different kinds of programming languages without actually transmitting any code um, to the service. Right, a couple of concerns that I've heard about uh, people sending or companies sending data over to Launchable is really their concern, they have some proprietary code. They just, they don't wanna have their, very valuable, very, in, in, in many cases, secret code being right. sent over to Launchable and somehow being analyzed by, analyzed by by us or our engine. And so I think that gives some clarity around that. Actually, it's it's really just metadata that, that really doesn't have anything to do with your actual software itself. It's kind of sitting above above that layer. Yeah. And, and that reminds me that the CLI does have a, like a dry run mode where you can run the CLI commands that, that um, that collect this information and you can see what would be sent without actually sending it, um, which is uh, pretty useful for getting visibility into that. Right, right. Looks like we have another question here. Uh, this one is around the flaky score. So is there some natural explanation for the flaky score? What does one and what does zero mean? That's a good question. Um, we, we think of flakiness like a, um, Kind of like a continuum, right? A test isn't isn't just flaky or not. It's it is it has exhibited flakiness over a certain period of time, and so <clears throat> a test that's only flaked against one build ever is and then been very predictable for every other build would have a very low score, closer to zero. Whereas a test that is consistently flaking um, would have a score that's closer to one. So. It's basically trying to show that show that continuum. Um, I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, I can follow up later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I, I think it does make sense. Um, have another question around pricing. Uh, you know, we have we always get questions around our pricing, and I think it's one of one of the interesting things about um, about how Launchable does business, and that we really we really only charge if we save you time. Uh, and I think that that's a little bit different than what people are usually expecting. Uh, is there, have you seen any, or can you, can you talk a little bit about how we save, how, how we actually save dev teams time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we do, uh, that's right. We do price based on time savings. Um, and we think about time savings in terms of if you were going to run all the tests, it would take a certain amount of time. And Launchable gives you the ability to not run all of the tests. And so that difference between the, uh, the, the how long it takes to run the full suite and how long it took to run a subset is what we say is we've saved you that time. Um, so basically you, you request, a, you know, you request and run a bunch of subsets and we calculate the time savings based on that information. Um, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, so we, we, we essentially only charge you if it's useful to you. This is yeah, really at, exactly. at, the, is at the core of it. Right, and, and also, you know, if you, if you choose, a, you, you have the ability to control your time savings because you choose the optimization target, right? So if you save more time, if you want to be more aggressive, then you will spend more because you're getting more value out. If you choose a less aggressive target um, and you're not saving as much time, you don't spend as much. So you have that control as well, yeah. Great. Well, I think that's all of our questions for today. So thank you very much, Al. Uh, and thank you very much for our webinar attendees. Uh, we'll everybody. be sending this, sending this as a video to you. Uh, so thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.
All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.